go ahead ma'am so good afternoon everyone this is uh, dr gayatri satpati i am a fertility consultant practicing at oss fertility at bhubaneswar in today's uh, discussion we shall be discussing everything about uh, what you need to know about ivf so this is going to be a very useful video for all the couples who are undergoing or are going to plan an ivf cycle so without wasting time we'll start our presentation so before we actually go into uh, the ivf part it is important that we understand a bit about how the natural conception happens so every month for a female from the ovary there is a release of one uh, head a uh, healthy egg and this process is called as ovulation and in the process of ovulation the egg gets released from the ovary and then it enters the fallopian tube at the same time an intercourse happens and the sperms are uh, traveling from the vagina they travel into the fallopian tube so inside the fallopian tube the sperm and egg meet and the fertilization of the egg happens and the embryo develops inside the fallopian tube then after 3 days of stay inside the fallopian tube the embryo travels into the uterus and further pregnancy grows inside the uterus so such a complex uh, mechanism uh, for pregnancy uh, is happening inside the fallopian tube so all this Uh, when it happens outside uh, the human body then this process is what is called as an in vitro fertilization so in vitro fertilization it is also a type of fertility procedure and it is short for what is called as ivf so it is a fertility procedure where the egg and the sperm meet outside the uh, fallopian tube and uh, so they are artificially they are uh, met and uh, the fertilization happens outside the human body so just uh, to brief you why this process why is it called as in vitro fertilization or why this name came up it was it is because in vitro is a latin word for glass so uh, when the first in vitro fertilization happened the sperm and egg were met together in a glass dish so this is how the name came up as uh, in vitro fertilization so uh, this is very short about the history of ivf so the first ivf uh, procedure happened uh, way back uh, in 1978 and the first uh, baby was born on 25th july 1978 and in the picture you can see the uh, uh, mrs uh, louise brown and she is the first ivf uh, child who was born and now she is 45 years old and uh, her mother underwent ivf because both her fallopian tubes were blocked and the good news is that louise brown itself be herself became a mom and uh, and she however conceived naturally so the first ivf was done in the world because of the block fallopian tube so in this uh, slide i am just showing you what are the routine uh, reasons for which we perform ivf so one of the important reason is of course there is a tubal factor that is if one or both the tubes are blocked the second uh, important uh, cause is when there is a woman who is suffering from endometriosis because in this condition most of the times the uterus the tubes and the ovaries they get affected the third uh, reason is when they have low ovarian reserve which again could be because of many reasons uh, such as if she has endometriosis or there is some genetic cause or if she is of advanced age so again advanced maternal age especially if they are more than 35 years so they generally tend to have a low ovarian reserve so in these women also we tend to prefer ivf and those uh, couples who have underwent multiple uh, failed i um, uh, iui or artificial insemination cycle so after a number of uh, iui failures so then the best treatment now is to go for an ivf so apart from this so, uh, so in this particular slide i have actually enlisted all the uh, indications for an ivf so as you can see the most common is when there are multiple factors that is both male and female have some factors together which is uh, now leading to and to um, go for an ivf the second again important factor is when there is a male factor alone that is if there is a low sperm count or a very low sperm count where iui will not help so then uh, we go for an ivf then again a major part is contributed by an unexplained cause that is both male and female have uh, no uh, reason for uh, infertility and they failed uh, or they might have failed multiple iui cycles so then the best line of treatment is and then again multiple factors could be there in female there could be tubal factor a diminished ovarian reserve then ovulatory dysfunction so this is very common in conditions like pcos or if a woman is overweight or she has thyroid problems so the ovulation is not happening properly so there again ivf can help and endometriosis and uterine factors so uterine factors could be reasons like if the uterus has been affected with conditions such as tuberculosis or ashman syndrome or if there may be some women who do not have a uterus so they can have their own biological child using ivf 
So let's understand the process of IVF for in vitro fertilization. So before the couple actually goes into the process of IVF, it is important that they have a one in one to one discussion with a fertility specialist uh, who will explain them in detail why this um, uh, procedure was opted for them, what was the cause of infertility for them. Uh, the fertility uh, specialist would like to evaluate both the partners uh, before going into the IVF cycle and, and would also explain to the couple what are the chances of success and what is the procedure in detail. So the pre-IVF testing is done on both the partner. For a female, we most commonly do the hormone testing. Uh, of the hormones, most important is to do an anti-Mullerian hormone test. Apart from this, we also check for the thyroid hormones, the prolactin hormone, the sugar levels, uh, etc. And the second uh, test is the hysterosalpingogram. Again, this is done only in selective cases. It's not done routinely for all women who are going for an IVF cycle. Then third is to do a genetic analysis. Again, this is done selectively especially those females who have underwent multiple failed IVF cycle or who have history of any genetic disease in the family or if there is any female who has repeated pregnancy losses or miscarriages. So then we would like to do the genetic testing of both the male and the female partner. And then a pelvic ultrasound is done routinely for all the females before she goes into the actual uh, IVF cycle. So in an ultrasound, we try to assess the ovarian reserve. We look at the ovaries, we count the antral follicles, and we also assess this uh, condition of the uterus. For a male, most commonly the pre-IVF testing uh, requires uh, just a semen analysis. However, if the semen analysis is of not of very optimum uh, quality, either the count is not good or any other uh, thing is suspected, then sometimes we may have to go for a physical examination and uh, to supplement it, we may also have to do some hormonal tests for the male partner as well. Uh, so the uh, IVF process uh, is actually a series of steps. So these are the different steps which are involved uh, when a couple goes through an IVF cycle. The first step is the ovarian hyperstimulation. The second step is transvaginal oocyte retrieval. Third step is egg and sperm preparation. Fourth step is egg fertilization. Fifth step is embryo culture. And the sixth uh, and the final step is embryo transfer. So uh, let us now go in detail uh, step by step and learn what is happening in all these steps. So the step one is ovarian hyperstimulation. Now why it's called hyperstimulation? Because in IVF, we are basically trying to stimulate the ovaries such that we are we get maximum number of eggs from both the ovaries. So to get maximum eggs, we have to maximum uh, stimulate. And so the name is hyperstimulation. So um, what is done is uh, generally uh, from the periods day two or day three, a woman is, uh, uh, injection, woman is started on injections. Again, the dose of these injections are decided based on the weight of the woman, what is her ovarian uh, reserve. So generally, these injections are given for a period of 10 to 12 days. During the course of these injections, two to three times scans are done to uh, assess if the right dose is being given and if she is responding or not, or if any titration is required. Now, once the follicles uh, reach a particular size, the next step is that we collect the eggs. But before that, a trigger injection is given, which is the final injection of uh, an IVF cycle. So after this trigger injection, the uh, and 34 to 36 hours later, we do this procedure, which is called as egg retrieval or egg collection. Now, this procedure is done under general anesthesia. The procedure generally takes 15 to 30 minutes. And uh, after the procedure, the woman uh, stays in the observation room for uh, two to three hours. And when she's comfortable, she can go back home. Or the procedure is done vaginally. There is no cut abdominally. So the woman is absolutely fine because she is under general anesthesia or light sedation. And uh, she can go back home the same day. And the third step is the egg and sperm preparation. So once the follicles have been aspirated or once the eggs have been collected, so they are kept uh, in rest uh, in proper medium in the lab for uh, first three to four hours. Meanwhile, the partner, the male partner has given the semen sample. On the same day, we are collecting eggs from the female partner. This semen sample is now processed um, in the lab. So we, uh, centrifugation is done and good quality sperms are separated. Uh, then the, import, the most important step is step four, which is a fertilization. Now we have two ways of fertilization. One, one way is called as ICSI and the second is a classic IVF. So ICSI is uh, short for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And IVF is, um, the, so the, the difference is that in IVF, we keep each egg uh, along with a particular number of sperms. So the basic idea is that 
uh, the best sperm is going to be self selected so it is going to compete among the rest of the sperm and will itself um, go inside uh, the egg material and it will fertilize it but the the other way is now uh, which we also done routinely also it's called as icsi so in this what happens is the embryologist uh, tries to select the sperm manually the best uh, looking or the uh, appearing sperm is selected and it is directly injected into the egg with the aim of fertilization so uh, however there are particular cases where actually icsi is more preferred uh, in comparison to ivf so these are cases like when we have severe male infertility that means that if the count of the sperm in the semen sample is so low or if the sperm has been collected directly from testes so in those cases we don't we cannot go for an ivf so in those cases because the number of sperm is itself very less so the sperms have to be individually injected into the uh, eggs the second is if we have oocyte abnormality particularly if the outer layer of the egg appears very thick so then it is it may be difficult for the sperm to penetrate inside the egg so in those cases also we go for icsi also if the eggs have been frozen previously for example many women nowadays go for egg freezing social egg freezing so in these women also the outer layer of the egg generally remains hard so in these women we prefer icsi then third is women's age most of the times if the mother's age is on the higher side the quality of the eggs may not be so good so in those cases also to enhance the chances of fertilization icsi is preferred then uh, couples in whom we require to do a genetic analysis of the embryo which is called as pre implantation genetic testing so in those cases it is important that we do an icsi rather than an ivf and then there are there could be couples who have had multiple ivf failure and classic ivf was done for fertilization so in for a next time we go for an icsi to increase the chance of fertilization so the next step is embryo culture so once fertilization happens now the um, embryo is left to grow uh, and a good environment is given within the lab where the temperature humidity and the gases are maintained and the embryos are now grow in this well controlled environment Uh, so by day three, uh, we check whether how many embryos have formed, and uh, once we check those, again we leave them to grow. Most of the times, we keep the embryos to grow till day five or uh, day six of the development. So the embryos which are able to reach this particular day five stage, so these embryos are called blastocysts, and at this stage, we ca we cannot leave them further to grow in the lab because after this stage, the blastocyst embryo requires a mother's uterus to grow further. so uh, this is an example uh, this is a picture of an incubator which we use in our lab uh, so we um, so the separate dishes are there because each dish is separately labeled with the couple's uh, name and id and then um, the temperature is maintained humidity and uh, all the gases are all well maintained in these incubators once the embryos are formed the embryo freezing is done uh, so the embryo freezing is done uh, within um, the liquid nitrogen containers at minus 196 degrees the final step is embryo transfer so previously uh, most of the times the embryo transfer used to be done on by uh, using the day 3 embryos but because now the labs are more advanced and we are able to grow the embryos for a longer time as i mentioned most of the times we are now preferring to grow the embryos till day 5 stage so nowadays we are doing day 5 of blastocyst embryo transfer blastocyst embryos have more potential to give pregnancy than a day 3 embryo transfer and again embryo transfer could be fresh embryo transfer or they could be frozen embryo transfer fresh embryo transfer is when the in the same cycle when the pick uh, the egg collection has happened in the same cycle itself the embryos are placed inside the uterus and but nowadays most of the time again we prefer to do a frozen embryo transfer where in the same cycle we just freeze all the embryos and in the next cycle after getting the uh, uterus ready we transfer the embryos so embryo transfer procedure is done under ultrasound guidance so this is a picture where you can see the ultrasound image and uh, we can see that uh, the catheter which uh, contains the embryos uh, so this catheter is passed inside the uterus under the guidance of ultrasound so we exactly know where we are depositing the embryo so this enhances our success rate an embryo transfer procedure is uh, not done under anesthesia it's uh, it takes hardly 3 to 5 minutes it it uh, without anesthesia women are comfortably able to uh, undergo the embryo uh, transfer procedure and they also they, they just take a, a rest of 30 minutes to 1 hour and then they can go back home the same day so to understand what is the overall timeline of the ivf treatment from the ovarian stimulation to the embryo transfer so it generally takes between 4 to 6 weeks so uh, how do we prepare our body for ivf so uh, it's very important 
because uh, if we prepare ourselves well, we can, we can get good results. So most important is that you educate yourself about the IVF process. So you understand, you get good information, any doubt, you always consult your fertility specialist and be emotionally prepared. And for this, you need a support of uh, your partner as well. You get your health checkups done beforehand. You eat a healthy and well-balanced diet. You take your vitamins, supplements, and antioxidants as advised by your fertility specialist. You quit smoking and drinking. You avoid caffeine or at least limit the quantity of caffeine and nicotine. And you take regular sleep and you don't stress yourself. So for that, you can even practice some deep breathing exercises or yoga in your life. So uh, now let us break a few myths which are surrounding IVF. So as we all know, IVF is now becoming a well accepted and it's a very common procedure, fertility procedure that is being offered to the couples. But still there are a lot of myths which are surrounding IVF. So it is important that we understand those um, before we are going into this journey of IVF. So one of the very important myth is that IVF is only way to conceive if you are uh, having this problem of infertility. No. So when you are coming to a fertility specialist, so we try to evaluate you, find out the cause. And most of the times, even we want you to conceive naturally. Uh, so we may give you some medicines and we try IUI. So only if these things fail, then the next option is to go for an IVF. So generally, IVF is actually the last option for most of the couples. Uh, to help them to achieve pregnancy. But yes, there could be some uh, conditions where IVF is the only option. For example, if man has no or low sperm count, if a woman has come with a very low egg reserve, so or if a woman has blocked fallopian tubes, which cannot be corrected surgically. So in those conditions, IVF is the only way out. So uh, the second myth is IVF always results in twins or multiples. And uh, uh, Yes, this was a thing of the past, but now because of the advancements in the technology and that now we are able to do single embryo transfer, this is big, uh, single pregnancy is what we are now commonly seeing. And we are very less encountering twin pregnancies. Uh, so the third is IVF treatment or medication can increase the risk of your cancer. Uh, no, because the medications or the injections that we give you during your IVF process, these are all made with recombinant technology. These are absolutely safe, painless. They do not have any adverse reactions or any allergic reactions. And also there are no studies which have proven that uh, use of these IVF medications or injections increase the risk of your cancer. That IVF is a very traumatic procedure. This is again a myth because IVF is now a very patient-friendly procedure. Most of the women who come to us are also working. So they, even they don't have to take any break from their work. They can schedule their injection times according to their convenience. They take the injections and go back to their workplace. And even the injections are so fine and thin that they, there is absolutely no pain. And most of the times the patients are very comfortable. And IVF maybe increases the risk of birth defects. Absolutely no. The, uh, we are only uh, using the process of IVF to create the embryo. However, it does not increase the risk of birth defect. Uh, the small risk of birth defect is there with any kind of pregnancy. Even a spontaneous pregnancy has around 2 to 5% risk of birth defect. The same applies to IVF. In fact, when actually decrease the risk of birth defects uh, in your pregnancy uh, through IVF, if we additionally go for genetic testing of the embryo, thereby we know which embryo is genetically healthy, so more or less likely that you are not going to have a birth defect in the baby. Then one IVF failure increases the chance of uh, that you are not going to have pregnancy again. Again, this is uh, not a right thing because uh, you, just because there is one IVF failure does not mean that there is no hope for any pregnancy. We need to evaluate, to evaluate you a bit more further. We need to do further more tests, find out what is the cause. And if any particular cause has been found, we would like to act accordingly. So in my next slides, I will actually also highlight this, like how do we manage people who are having a failed IVF cycle? Because there are many couples who have conceived even after three, four, five, even seven IVF cycles. So the most important thing is that you don't lose hope and always keep trying. And uh, there are um, a, a lot of complications in IVF pregnancy. Again, this is a myth. Uh, complication in any pregnancy is um, because of any pre-existing or any new disease which has um, started during the pregnancy. So IVF is only a way to achieve pregnancy, but IVF does not lead to any complications in pregnancy. Then again, this is a myth that if you are going for an 
then definitely it's going to have a 100% success rate. No, because just like any other fertility treatment, IVF it's also has its own success rate. Uh, no doubt that compared to simpler treatments like IUI, I IVF has a very high success rate. But gen most of the time, the success rate is between 40 to 50% for most couples who are less than 35 years. There are many factors uh, which uh, actually contribute to the success of IVF. The most important is the age of the couple, for how long they have been trying, what was the cause of infertility, if there is any background, biological, hormonal, or genetic factors which are uh, which are causing the infertility. Then again, this is a myth. As I mentioned, IVF is always successful. Uh, no, it's not a guarantee that it will give you a birth, but then definitely uh, because now IVF has become more advanced and now it's been 45 years into practice and millions of babies have been born worldwide, it's definitely an advanced level of fertility treatment. But then the success of any particular treatment depends on multiple factors. So that's why it's very important that pre-IVF, you have a good one-to-one -one discussion with your fertility specialist and understand what is your success, what is the chances of your success with, with the IVF program. Then the other myth is IVF leads to hormonal problems later in life. Again, uh, this is a myth because most of the medications which are given, these are all made through recombinant technology. They stay only in the uh, blood uh, for uh, around 24 hours. And after 24 hours, there is no trace of these medication. So long-term problems or any hormonal problems in later life is actually a myth. Then this is again a myth. IVF procedure requires hospitalization. No, because most of the IOP procedures are done on a daycare basis. For example, the egg collection procedure, you go back home the same day. Embryo transfer, you go back home the same day. Rest of the days also, you take the injections and then go back. So it's a, uh, it's a daycare procedure, totally. That IVF pregnancy means uh, delivery is only by C-section. Again, that's wrong. Uh, what type of uh, delivery you are going to have is only decided towards the end of your pregnancy. So at that time, the doctor uh, checks the baby's growth, the baby's weight, what is the uh, condition of the any other problem is there in the pregnancy or not. And then depending on that, the doctors can decide. More, many of the IVF pregnancies are also delivered uh, naturally. Then this is a very common question that is asked uh, and which people think that they require an absolute bed rest following uh, and uh, in the IVF cycle or following embryo transfer. Again, you do not require a complete bed rest. We actually advise against this. We do not want you to take a complete bed rest following embryo transfer because this is actually going to increase the chances of infection and decrease our success rate. The more mobile you, you are, the more active you are, the more uh, normal lifestyle you lead, the more chances that you are going to have a uh, pregnancy outcome, a positive pregnancy outcome. So what are the positive signs following embryo transfer? So some signs you may have before you are doing the blood test. Uh, you may uh, experience some symptoms and which may be a, um, a positive thing, which may indicate that you are going to get pregnant. For example, if you are experiencing some nausea or vomiting, if you're experiencing some bloating, or frequently you need to pass urine, or if you missed your periods, or if there is some slight bleeding or spotting, or if there is any breast tenderness or soreness. So these could be some favorable uh, signs that you may get pregnant. But again, these symptoms can also be because of the medications that you are taking post embryo transfer. So it is important that we wait for the number of days that your doctor has advised you. And we do, only when we do a blood test, we, are, we can confirm that you are pregnant or not pregnant. So uh, these are the do's and don'ts after embryo transfer in a very uh, most commonly asked question um, by the couples. So rest, see only a 30 minutes to maximum one hour of rest is more than enough following an embryo transfer, which you have taken in the hospital. Once you go back home, you have to lead a normal life. You do not have to be on any kind of bed rest. So daily activities as usual, you can even go back to your work and uh, and do all the normal work what we are doing at home. Yes, but heavy work or lifting heavy objects are not allowed. Then drinking plenty of fluids, keeping yourself hydrated is very important. You take a well-balanced diet. Avoid outside and processed food and any uh, sugary foods uh, during this period. Uh, you do not, uh, and for medication-wise, whatever medicines your doctor has advised you to take following the embryo transfer is what you are going to take. Uh, any extra medications, if you have any doubt, always consult a fertility specialist and then take. Avoid immersion baths, particularly avoid hot water baths and sauna because you may land up with infections. So for that, we ask you to avoid them. And we also ask uh, to avoid sexual intercourse. This is only to prevent the infections. 
so when do you do the pregnancy test so after the embryo transfer so most of the times 12 to 14 days or maximum 15 days after the embryo transfer is we ask you to do a blood test which confirms whether you are pregnant or not pregnant so what do we do with the frozen embryos? This is again a very important question. So the basic idea of doing an IVF and hyperstimulating your ovary is that we have a lot of embryos. Why? Because suppose in your first embryo transfer, the embryo transfer failed and you did not get pregnant. So you can again try for a pregnancy using doing only an embryo transfer. You do not have to start from the big, from step number one. So we can keep doing embryo transfers alone till you achieve pregnancy. Or if you have achieved a pregnancy and there are extra embryos remaining in the lab, you can use them for getting pregnant a second time or a third time after a gap of few years. The embryos once frozen, they can stay in the lab in the same condition for months and years together. So there is absolutely nothing to worry about. So what type of food do you eat uh, during and after? Uh, so what? Uh, so this is around the IVF cycle and also around the embryo transfer. So it is important that you take a well-balanced, healthy diet. You need to ensure that micronutrients, all vitamins, minerals are going inside your body. So food like whole grains and uh, then good fish like uh, salmon, then sweet potato, nuts and berries grains, avocado, leafy vegetables, and fruits. So these are the things which you need to incorporate in your diet. You need to avoid packaged food, fast food, spicy food, undercooked meat. You need to avoid fish which contains a lot of mercury. For example, uh, the swordfish or mackerel fish. And avoid um, caffeinated beverages or reduce the amount of nicotine and caffeine. And avoid uh, alcoholic beverages and avoid foods which you are allergic to. And uh, in short about exercise and yoga after embryo transfer, yes, you can do mild form of exercises. You can go for walk and uh, all you can even do those yoga postures and exercises that are safe in pregnancy. Like the up, you can concentrate more on your upper body, arm, your legs, and you can do back strengthening exercises. Um, so these are good, but do not avoid, do, do such kind of exercises which are going to put a lot of pressure on your lower belly. And travel after embryo transfer, yes, following embryo transfer, you don't have to be get locked up in your uh, house. You can go out for some time, for like you want to go for a short shopping or you want to go for a movie, you can do that. But be careful on the road bumps. You need to relax. You also need to enjoy this period. Uh, however, you can avoid travel uh, using bike or auto. Again, these are the very important questions which are asked to us. So can I climb stairs following embryo transfer? Yes, because most of the women they are having, um, if they have their houses uh, upstairs, so they need to use the stairs so they can slowly walk. And can I use Indian toilet? Yes, because again, Western toilets are not available everywhere. So Indian toilets can be used. Only thing is while passing stool or urine, you do not have to put a lot of pressure. Uh, can I drink hot water? Yes, you can drink hot water. Can I bath daily? Yes, you need to bath daily actually because you need to maintain a good hygiene also. Can I uh, bath in hot water? You don't. Uh, we do not actually generally advise you to take bath in hot water, and but you can take a head bath. And you, uh, we also advise to not to have sex following the embryo transfer. So, uh, in short, about why IVF fails. As I mentioned, you IVF again is a type of fertility treatment. It, any kind of fertility treatment has its own success. So IVF also does not have a 100% success rate. So most commonly, why it fails is when there is a poor quality of the eggs or sperm or if the embryo did not form of a good quality, or if there, um, for example, if there are lower grade embryos which are formed, there could be any genetic problem in the couple, or if the uterus has any issues, for example, if the lining of the uterus is not uh, forming well, or if there is any uterine malformation, so in such cases, IVF can fail. So, uh, so what should we do when a couple has come to us with a failed IVF cycle or if they have failed an IVF cycle with us, we need to evaluate a bit further. We would like to evaluate your uterus doing a hysteroscopy. We may have to do an endometrial receptivity array so that we know the correct time to place the embryo. We may do additional tests on the sperms like DNA fragmentation tests. We may evaluate you genetically more like we can do a couple karyotyping and sometimes an immunological test. So what are the treatment options for the next IVF cycle? So certain uh, test uh, options we may uh, offer based on your test results. Uh, sometimes we may offer you pre-implantation genetic testing of the embryo. Then advanced uh, techniques or procedures in the lab can be uh, thought about like assisted hatching of the embryo or doing an advanced sperm selection like PIXI or MAX. Then we have laser assisted hatching of the embryo and use of embryo glue. And sometimes if there is repeatedly, uh, we find that the egg quality or the sperm quality is very poor, then maybe we need to go for the third party uh, uh, reproduction options. That is, we may have to go for a 
donor egg or a donor sperm and uh, sometimes surrogacy is an option when the uterine uh, factor is, is a major factor which is not allowing you to go for a pregnancy. Uh, so I would like to end uh, today's uh, discussion by um, asking you all to always stay positive, think positive. Positive thoughts, uh, they uh, have a big impact on our um, on, on our success rates of, of any kind of treatment, even the IVF treatment. So I hope this was a very useful uh, discussion and I'm open for any kind of uh, questions if they're from the viewers. Thank you. Yeah, so please you can display any questions if there are uh, by the viewers. So do IVF babies look like their parents? Yes, why not? Yeah, definitely. If we, uh, if the, because the egg is collected from the woman and the sperm is of her uh, male partner, the, uh, the babies, if they are conceiving naturally or if they are conceiving IVF, there is no difference. So they can, uh, they will look like their parents only if we are using the egg and sperm from the same couple. But sometimes when we have to take the egg and sperm from a different source, then there can be an issue, but that also we, uh, for example, if an egg donor we have selected and we, we try to match the egg donor with the uh, primary couple as far as possible. So in that case is also it is the, the babies uh, many times they do not look much different from the parents. Is IVF safe for the mother and child? Yes, absolutely it is safe the, um, because now IVF um, has advanced so much. The quality of the injections that are used in IVF have increased so much that there is hardly any allergic reaction. There is hardly any other um, problems. Uh, so, so it's absolutely safe and, and also painless. So patients are very happy and they, are, uh, they do not complain of anything while they are undergoing the IVF procedure. Is IVF painful? No, absolutely not. Um, uh, even the ovarian hyperstimulation, the 10 to 12 days of injections which are given, they are not painful because the injections are so thin and fine that uh, the patients do not experience any pain. Uh, however, because these injections are costly, so it is important that they come and take the injections at the center and uh, get the injections delivered by a well-trained um, staff nurse. So I think um, these were the questions and any further questions you can always uh, ask us in the comment section and we would be happy to answer. Thank you so much.